Sunday, February 16th. We are still in Unit 3 of the Winter Quarter, Lesson 12, from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. Our lesson title is Ask for What Really Matters. Ask for What Really Matters. Our, well, let me back up. Our unit title, Unit 3, title is Jesus Teaches About True Worship. We're still in a series of lessons from the Gospels where Jesus is teaching about true worship. Our devotional reading is taken from Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 to 10, and then verse 16 to 17. And then background, our background scripture is also our printed passage, which is Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15. Our lesson aims or number one, explore the place of the Lord's prayer in the life of the church. Number two, long for the kingdom the Lord's prayer describes to be manifested in your life. And then number three, pray the Lord's prayer with deeper appreciation for its meaning. The lesson has three, I'm sorry, two major divisions after the introduction. The first is the model, and that's speaking about the model prayer, and that's covered between Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. And the second is the meaning, and that's covered between chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. From the standard commentary, our lesson title is Kingdom Seeking Prayer. Kingdom Seeking Prayer and additional aims are number one, recite the Lord's Prayer or commonly known as the model prayer. Number two, explain the petitions of the Lord's Prayer. And then number three, write a prayer that focuses on one aspect of the Lord's Prayer he or she tends to overlook, that's you or me tend to overlook. Uh, this outline, the outline of this lesson has two major divisions as well. The first is the prayer. It's covered between verses 9 and 13. The second is on forgiveness. And that's covered between verses 14 and 15. Now, in the way of a little background, uh, Jesus is still in his, uh, what has been known as the Beatitudes or his sermon uh, on the Beatitudes of the Blessings, uh, and that's covered between Matthew chapter 5 and 7. If you'll recall from last week, uh, our lesson was also taken from, from Matthew uh, chapter 6. And Jesus uh, spoke on two areas where people tend to be hypocritical. People tend to do things for for show and for human rewards, uh, such as give alms. Uh, he uh, and he used some uh, hyperbole uh, to suggest that people were so, wanted to draw so much attention to their uh, giving, abundant giving, that they would sound a trumpet. Uh, and Jesus said they have their reward. And he, he suggested that, or he said, rather, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, but give in secret, and what you do in secret, the Lord will reward openly. He also spoke about prayer, how uh, many hypocrites, uh, and those, certainly uh, many of those were scribes and Pharisees, uh, gave long prayers, uh, even like the heathen, where they offered vain repetitions to be heard of men so that men would praise them. And he said, uh, to be seen of men, he said. And, of course, he said they had their reward. But then he said uh, that the correct way to pray, certainly these are private prayers, was to go to your closet, close the door behind you so that you're not distracted and so that no one... Uh, sees or hears uh, your praise and petition before the Lord. 
and what you pray for in secret, he said, that said the Lord will, when you pray in secret, the Lord will reward you openly. So that's kind of the backdrop of our lesson today. Jesus continues in chapter 6 uh, where he actually uh, gives a model prayer, what many have called a model prayer. And there is a parallel passage in Luke 11, which really um, gives a little more detail on this prayer. Uh, so read that, the model or the parallel in chapter 11. And we see in, in uh, Luke 11, 1, where Jesus is actually asked by one of his disciples to teach them to pray as John taught his disciples. And so that is what um, prompted this prayer. And the prayer is slightly different. Uh, perhaps Jesus uh, gave this model prayer uh, on more than one occasion, but it's, it's very close. Now, this is, it is very often called the Lord's Prayer. Um, and I take issue with that because it, it is a model that the Lord gave us uh, to pattern prayers by. He said, after this manner, pray. He didn't say, pray this exact prayer uh, every time you pray. Uh, he'd already spoken about vain repetitions. Uh, but the Lord's Prayer is actually uh, recorded in John chapter 17. That's where the Lord in the upper room uh, prays before his father for uh, his disciples, and he prays to be glorified as he was with him uh, before. And he prays for those who would believe on him by or through the testimony of his disciples and his apostles or those disciples that would become apostles, that including us. So the Lord's Prayer is recorded in John chapter 17. However, this is a great model for our prayer. The Lord teaches us in this prayer what to put our emphasis on when we come before the Lord. And so we're going to we're going to jump in here at verse 9 and we're going to have some verse by verse discussion and try and get a fuller understanding of something that's very familiar to us. We've been praying this prayer uh, most likely all of our lives and hopefully we'll get a deeper understanding despite that despite we're very familiar with it than we've had before. So let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you, Lord, for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, we pray that you give us a clear understanding, Lord, of how to order our prayer, Lord, what to pray for, Lord, what to place emphasis on in our prayers before you, Lord. Lord, not to think uh, that uh, all of our prayers should be about asking for things that would benefit us in some material way, Lord, but to seek, Lord, your kingdom, your will to be done in our lives, Lord, and in this sin, sick, and dying world. We just thank you, Lord, for uh, the another opportunity, as I said, to, to study your precious word, and we pray as we understand it that our faith would be increased, and as our faith is increased, that our obedience we, would be increased. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin with the prayer. Uh, Let's look at verse 9a. Jesus said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. So, uh, again, he has just finished talking about hypocritical prayers, uh, prayers that uh, were prayed to be seen of men, and uh, they were long, they were verbose, uh, repetitious, vain repetitions uh, to present uh, the prayer as some as more spiritual uh, than the other uh, than, uh, than listeners perhaps uh, but he says after this manner therefore pray ye and again not intended to be a uh, a prayer to be recited exactly verbatim the way he prays it but it's to be an example of what we're to pray for and how we are to approach the Lord in our prayer. So part B of verse nine says, our father, our father. And we see <clears throat> that Jesus throughout the gospels addresses uh, God, the father, not only as his father, but in many instances as our father. 
And this was really not that common for the Israelites or the Judeans of his day. Uh, first century Jews, uh, this more often described the Lord um, in other ways, creator, Lord, king, but not in, in such an intimate way as our father. But, uh, but that, what, that is exactly what it suggests. It suggests an intimacy, uh, a close relationship, but also uh, it suggests uh, that we are praying to a provider. Uh, fathers are typically providers and they take care of their children. And I understand some of us uh, may have had difficult relationships with our father. We may have had strained relationships. We may have had no relationships with our father. Or our fathers may have been very, very poor examples of fatherhood. And sometimes that's very difficult to get over uh, because when we think of father, we think of, uh, we reflect on perhaps what our experience, bad experiences might have been with our father. But typically, a father is a provider and one that truly loves and, and certainly would die for his children. And, 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 and we are certainly to realize that God is the perfect father. He doesn't have perfect children. We know that from Adam and Eve as first. But he is the perfect father and the perfect provider. And it also suggests uh, a level of access. Uh, we have access to our father. When we address the Lord as, as king, of course, creator, Lord, king, uh, it doesn't suggest that we have the immediate access that one would have uh, to a father in any time of need or a loving parent in any time of need. And that's what this this title that Jesus addresses God by uh, suggests. Part C of verse 9 says, which art, art in heaven. Now, uh, God is certainly close to us. I mean, he's as close as a prayer. But he's not part of his creation. He's, he's far above his creation. Uh, he is otherness, uh, or he is uh, totally holy and separated from his creation, and his abode is in heaven. So he's acknowledging that while he's certainly close in terms of his intimacy with us and his ability to hear and answer our prayers, he is in a place, a holy place, uh, set apart from all of his creation. So we need to understand that while we are created in his image and we can have fellowship with him, close fellowship with him, he is not one of us. He is the God of heaven. He is not one of us. And part D of verse 9 says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Well, what does the word hallowed mean it really means uh, sacred. It means uh, consecrated. Uh, be your name. Now, this is the beginning of seven petitions that the Lord is going to make in four couplets. This this prayer is uh, is a, a bit of poetry uh, in that it has couplets uh, that are two. Uh, expressions or two phrases coupled together uh, and there are seven petitions made within four couplets throughout the balance of this prayer so the first one is hallowed be thy name and of course there are three petitions related to to God uh, and and uh, his kingdom and and the sacredness of his name uh, but and then there are four related to our human needs uh, and, and so we'll get into those uh, as we progress in the lesson here. Now, this hallowed also really expresses a commitment to to honor God, to honor his name, which is a, in, 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 consistent with the third commandment, that thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain, Exodus 27. Uh, so uh, we are to treat his name as holy uh, and, and we are to understand that uh, his holiness uh, is uh, 
is is reflected in his his name, or actually his name really speaks of all that he is, and certainly, first and foremost, he is holy. Now, uh, one of the commentators suggests that, I mean, there's a great paradox here. On the one hand, you know, we're to speak as him as, as um, uh, other, uh, he's, he's uh, the holy one, and he's completely uh, uh, set apart from us. But on the other hand, uh, we can address him as father, again, which suggests a close intimacy. Uh, but uh, there should not be any any uh, any paradox there, because while uh, we, uh, as I said, we he's a he's a prayer away. His spirit actually indwells every believer, so we are partakers of his divine nature through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yet he is holy, uh, and we are to respect him as the Holy One. Verse 10. This is, uh, this is actually uh, two of the petitions. Uh, two and three. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. His kingdom come. Uh, and uh, so what is he talking about there? He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the reign, God's reign and sovereign rule. And let's understand something. I mean, God is sovereign. God is in control of everything. Uh, nothing happens in this universe without God's permission. But God has a perfect will, a perfect will, and he has what I've uh, referred to as a as a permissive will. In other words, he allows sin to exist in his universe for a time, but there's going to come an, uh, an end to that. But we are speaking of his, when we speak of his kingdom, his perfect will, his perfect rule, uh, his perfect uh, uh, reign over, over all. And certainly, the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, is in our hearts, in the hearts of the believer. He's to have perfect rule in our hearts and in our lives now. Certainly, he will establish his perfect rule on this earth. And certainly, uh, it is as now uh, being, uh, it has been established in heaven and it is being observed in heaven, his very perfect will in heaven. So as, as it is in heaven now, where there's nothing that offends the Lord, where everything is perfect, uh, it will be on this earth. And now in praying that, asking for those petitions, uh, the, he is suggesting that we uh, commit ourselves to being a part of uh, establishing his perfect will on this earth. And how are we to do that? We are to reflect him in this world. We are to reflect uh, his his uh, uh, his mercy. We're to reflect his forgiveness. We're to reflect his love. We're to reflect his wisdom. We are to be light and salt in this sin sick and dying world, and we are to be the physical manifestation of Christ. That's why we're called the body of Christ. We are Christ is to be seen in us, and and as he is seen in us, hearts are converted. Hearts are, are, are submitted to the kingdom, the rule of God in this earth. So as we, we pray this, uh, we are praying that all opposition to God in this world will cease, that all will come to faith in him, uh, and that uh, he would, uh, uh, that the hearts of men would be transformed in this earth. And, sub, and again, as I said, submit to his reign and rule. And again, we commit ourselves to helping to achieve that result. Now, we, we don't do that in our own strength, obviously. We do that uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit or by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Verse 11. This is another <clears throat> couplet. I mean, another uh, petition, I should say. Give us this day our daily Bread. Now, this is a supplication, a specific need that's being asked for. Now, um, certainly, uh, we should ask for what is needed for sustenance, our food. But 
this is generally thought to to uh, represent all of our physical needs, and we're to realize that that God is the provider of all of our physical needs: food, water, clothing, shelter, everything we we stand in need of. God provides. Now some. Vain people may think, well, I work and I earn my money and I pay my bills, I pay my house note and so forth. Well, you know, it's God that gives us power to get wealth. It is God that enables you to to uh, provide uh, for your own needs, who gives you the strength, who gives you the wisdom, who gives you the opportunities. And certainly God is providing uh, for all of our needs as he does uh, for the the fowl of the air, you know, not one sparrow falls without his notice. When you have a chance, uh, we can look at, in fact, uh, let's turn over and take a look at uh, Luke. Well, actually, I'll just paraphrase a little bit from Luke chapter 12, but read Luke chapter 12, verses 27 to 31. And in that short passage, uh, the Lord talks about uh, how Solomon uh, and all of his Glory was not arrayed, arrayed or, or uh, clothed like the lily of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the fire. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 8.18 8, and James 1.17, which speaks about uh, God being the ultimate source of all of our livelihood. But as we read in, in uh, our lesson of a couple of weeks ago, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I, I, I made point of mentioning in my class that uh, the, the, the word of God is even more than our physical uh, nourishment. Jesus uh, actually quoted that scripture when he was being tempted of Satan in the wilderness. Uh, it is more important than our physical nourishment the word of God, and we we need to remember that Jesus himself is the bread of life, the sustenance of eternal life. Uh, We can see that in John, Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 48. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is a couplet, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, and those are uh, this is the fifth petition, uh, and um, again, of the seven, of the seven. Now, our debts uh, is a belief to mean our sin, our sin. In fact, uh, if we read uh, Matthew chapter 18, 23 to 35, we can put uh, that in more context. Uh, but that word here used uh, or translated debt really means our sin or our transgressions of the law even. So what's he saying here? He's saying, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us or our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, which means we are Forgiving those who trespass, who sin against us or commit uh, evil against us, if you will. Uh, And that is something that Jesus is going to emphasize more uh, after the prayer. Uh, And this petition is conditional. I mean, uh, we are saying, Lord, forgive us. As we forgive others, which suggests if we don't forgive others, we're not expecting the Lord to forgive us. And, of course, Jesus is going to drive that point home uh, further a little later. Let's look at verse 13a. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, this is the fourth and final couplet. Again, two phrases or or requests. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And uh, <clears throat> the seventh partition, this is a sixth rather, and seventh petitions. 
Um, Jesus is not suggesting that God would lead any of us into temptation. Uh, James 13, uh, I'm sorry, James 1 13 says, God does not tempt, neither can he be tempted. And so we know that um, he is not suggesting that God would lead us or allow for us to be well tempted to sin and 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 you know this is something that needs to be unpacked a little bit um obviously the lord allows our faith to be tried and satan sometimes um is used to try our faith satan tempts us to sin satan tempts us to sin uh but god as he did job uh, and as he did Jesus uh, when he was in the wilderness. But God uses those as trials. God does not tempt, but uh, Satan's intent, of course, is to tempt to sin. But what uh, he is saying and what we say when we pray, lead us not into temptation, is that we are recognizing uh, both that sin is lurking it is always uh, present. It's like a crouching lion uh, and our inability to conquer it in our own strength. So we are asking for God's delivering power from uh, the power of sin. And of course, those of us who uh, have truly been saved or indwelt by the Holy Spirit and have his power available to us. And we're told to walk in the spirit and we will not obey the lust of the flesh. And that means to walk by the enablement of the spirit, by his power. Now this word um, also, depending on the context, this word temptation, we know is very often uh, translated trial. And if it is that, uh, if that's the intent here, then certainly uh, what we're asking when we and when we ask God for His deliverance from uh, evil is is of course uh, from calamity, from trials, or to give us the ability to endure them. Um, this word is is used in. Uh, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where uh, I think it certainly means trial. This word translated temptation. Uh, you may recall that verse reads, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted or tried above that you, you are able to but will with the temptation or trial also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So in that context, I think it means trial. Um, 13b reads, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now both uh, commentators from the... uh, uh, commentators that I uh, mentioned, uh, we were studying from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly and the Standard, uh, say that this last uh, part of verse 13 is not in some of the oldest manuscripts. Um, and they suggest that it may have been borrowed, if you will, from First Chronicles 29, 11 to 13, <clears throat> where similar language is used. Um, they uh, suggest, however, at least the standard commentator, that fits well <clears throat> as a restatement of the themes of the petitions. God's coming kingdom, his power to provide, and our glorious deliverance from temptation and evil. So it it summarizes the uh, whole intent or the whole focus of the prayer and it closes in a similar fashion 
uh, as it, it opens, where uh, Jesus uh, begins the prayer by, by uh, calling on God, his Father, in heaven. And uh, we want to, uh, before we go into the last uh, uh, couple of verses, we want to uh, just take a step back and realize that the prayer, again, the first three petitions concerned those things that would further uh, God's kingdom on earth uh, and his will, uh, his perfect will being done. And certainly uh, our prayer should be that his perfect will be done in and through us. Uh, certainly we want it done throughout the world. We want his perfect will to be ubiquitous throughout the world. But certainly when we pray this prayer, we cannot pray it in earnest unless we truly desire for his perfect will to be done in and through us. Uh, also, it uh, you know we are uh, asking for uh, our daily needs. Again, in this prayer, it's bread. Uh, we make our supplications. Uh, and that, that ought not be the first thing that we lay before the Lord. Uh, I know some of you are familiar with the the acronym ACTS, which uh, gives us a, a guide for uh, how to approach God in prayer and order our prayers in terms of priority. A standing for uh, adoration. We are to acknowledge who he is and his greatness, certainly, uh, his mercy uh, and his his. Uh, is is grace uh, the the T stands for I'm sorry C stands rather for confession confession of our sins and certainly uh, Jesus had no sin uh, in this model prayer he gives uh, us uh, some guidance on how to pray for strength in in the midst of our temptations and our our uh, uh, our, our daily battles with sin and evil. Uh, and the, so the C stands for confession, which is something that we know that we certainly need to make as we sin. And then the T stands for thanksgiving. We're to thank God for all, for every good and perfect gift, for, for the abundance that he provides for us. And we're to recognize that it is his provision. It's not our, uh, our wisdom, not our hard work that is responsible for what God has blessed us with. And even the daily needs, that is what we are to thank him for, and not take those things for granted. Food, clothing, shelter, sound minds, reasonable health and strength, uh, the wisdom that he gives us in his word, and certainly uh, for our salvation. And then S stands for supplication. That is when we lay out our list of needs, knowing as we do that God knows what we stand in need of even before we ask. So we don't uh, inform God of anything when we ask. What we do is we acknowledge that he is the provider of our daily needs, and, 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 and we acknowledge our dependence on him and our trust in him to continue to provide for our needs. So now we, <clears throat> we, we enter into the second division of both uh, lesson commentaries uh, and from the standard it's on forgiveness and from the quarterly it's the meaning verses 14 and 15 so verse 14 out of the prayer of course uh, Jesus uh, lifts uh, he actually emphasizes uh, uh, the importance of forgiveness so verse 14 reads, For if ye f forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now this word trespasses uh, is uh, used in place of debts, which was used uh, earlier uh, in the prayer in verse, uh, in verse 12, I believe it was. And it means, again, it means sin. It means uh, if we forgive someone, 
some evil uh, or some misdeed uh, that they've committed against us, then God will also forgive us. And this is this was that conditional petition, if you will. Uh, Jesus, uh, in the model prayer, stated, forgive us as we forgive others. Uh, and Jesus is driving home this point. He is making it clear that if we do forgive men their trespasses or sins uh, or evils committed against us, if you will, then uh, he would certainly uh, forgive us. Now, Jesus has a lot to say about forgiveness in the Gospels. You remember um, the his uh, disciples came to him once and asked how often should they forgive their brother, and they thought they they would be really magnanimous if they forgave him seven times. And he said, "I say unto you, seven seventy times seven, or four hundred and ninety times, really." meaning an an endless number of times you forgive him. And that forgiveness was uh, uh, contingent on him repenting, uh, whoever committed the offense against you, repenting uh, repenting and asking for forgiveness. But, um, you know, God commends our forgiveness even when one does not seek, does not repent, and does uh, does not ask for forgiveness. Remember Romans 5, 6 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God did not wait for us us to ask for salvation to die for us. He came seeking to save those of us who were lost. I mean, we weren't found or he wouldn't have had to come to seek and to save those of us who were lost. And so God wants us to have the same heart as he does in that regard when it comes to, to forgiving sinners, those who trespass against us and I think the Lord shares his heart in this regard um, that is uh, with regard to forgiving those who don't repent or seek uh, our forgiveness when he tells us to love our enemies do good to those who despitefully use us and he and he says we'll heap coals of fire on their head. So uh, God wants us to be like him. Uh, And and the the best uh, way we can imitate our father is to be forgiving of those who don't deserve our forgiveness, quite honestly, who are not seeking it and who uh, have despitefully used us. Verse 15, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is the condition uh, part of this. uh, He's emphasizing the the condition part of this uh, petition. If we don't forgive, then God won't forgive us. And I I think we need to unpack this a little bit as well. Um, We know that... uh, the Lord gives us an example of what God thinks about this in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, actually, if you read the passage um, from 21 to um, actually 21 to 35 uh, you read, first of all, about the forgiving um, a person 70 times 7. And then the Lord uh, spoke a parable about uh, uh, a ruler uh, having uh, servants, and one owed him uh, 10,000 talents, and he couldn't pay him, and he besought him that uh, he he would uh, forgive him the debt and have mercy on him, and <clears throat> the Lord, his Lord, had compassion on him and forgave him that debt. And of course, he went out and found a, a servant that ho- owed him the equivalent of, of fifty dollars. This this uh, uh, ten thousand talents was the equivalent of millions, uh, and the other guy owed him a hundred pence, the equivalent of fifty bucks or something like that. 
and he asked for mercy, and he would not have mercy on his fellow servant and sent him to de debtor's prison. And we know that his, some of his fellow servants went back and told the Lord, and the Lord uh, brought him back before him and said, I forgave you all that debt, and could not you have had mercy on your your fellow servant? And then he, of course, condemned him to be the debtor's prison to be sold and his family. So the Lord desires us to forgive because we have been forgiven. We are sinners just like those who uh, have trespassed against us. And as God has forgiven us all of our sins, we are to be like him and forgive others be, and show the same mercy that he showed to us to others. Now, you might ask, what, what does it really mean that God won't forgive us? Haven't we been forgiven if we've confessed our faith in Jesus Christ, accepted him as our Lord and Savior? Well, uh, maybe not. Maybe you haven't genuinely trusted the Lord as your Savior. Maybe you haven't genuinely been born again if you cannot forgive even as you are forgiven. And I would... I would really recommend reading First John, uh, and especially chapter four. Uh, John, in First John, uh, he gives some tests uh, to determine whether you are indeed in the faith. If you can love your brother, uh, 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 then uh, you are uh, like God, and God is in you, and you are in God. Uh, verse twelve says, "No man hath seen God at any time." If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Uh, and, and, and it says, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. And, and, and if, if we are indeed in him and he is in us and we have his spirit indwelling us, we ought to have uh, his heart. We ought to have his desires to be merciful. We ought to have uh, his his mercy. He's commanded us to be merciful as he's merciful. And we ought to have his capacity to forgive others even as, uh, and we certainly, and, and we, we sinful creatures have certainly committed uh, more heinous sins against our loving father and creator than anyone could commit against us. So in closing, we just want to, um, again, uh, review the focus of the prayer, and hopefully it will help us to shape our future prayers. I know sometimes, uh, you know, we come before the Lord and we don't take thought uh, as to how we organize our prayer, how we prioritize what we, uh, we lift before the Lord. Uh, sometimes we have specific needs for specific moments. We pray for someone's healing. We pray for faith. We pray for wisdom. We pray for guidance. And sometimes we just want to praise God for uh, for all that he's done for us, what he's doing for us, and for what he's promised to do for us. But I think uh, it's good for us to look at this model prayer as uh, a reminder uh, of the things that are important to God the Father, that the Lord Jesus uh, showed us were important to him, and that is uh, that his will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. That means his perfect will be, as I said, ubiquitous, be uh, pervasive throughout this sin sick and dying world. And of course, we know when we pray that prayer, we are recognizing that we need to be a part of that. And that begins with his perfect will be being done in us and through us uh, to affect uh, uh, the expansion of his kingdom in the hearts of men in this earth. Uh, and then certainly uh, we recognize that God is the provider of all of our needs. And we, we acknowledge our dependence on him when we recognize that we are nothing, we have nothing, and we can do nothing apart from him. So I pray that you have understood uh, this prayer, as I said earlier, which is very familiar. We've been praying it all our lives a little better, and it will help us. If this is not, and I, and I know we had no problem doing it as we were growing up as children, reciting it verbatim, but I, again, I don't believe that the Lord's intent 
was to what was for us to recite this prayer this prayer verbatim he said after this manner i think we should come to the lord uh with genuine uh expressions uh that are along these lines and uh really reflect what we uh, know because of this model prayer that God desires to hear from us. So we pray that God will bless you and keep you until such time as we, we meet again. Amen.